Greetings today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. I'm going to bring a message today on termites in the home. Now due to technical difficulty on the Sunday I brought this message, uh, I'm going to have to eliminate the singing today because I want to get more of the message on uh, tape because some have written in for the message. And so there won't be any singing or music on the tape today, but uh, there will be more on the, of the message. Now, when I delivered the message on Sunday, I failed to get all the message on uh, cassette tape. And so today we want to get the full message on tape. So you'll be listening to the sermon, the Word of God, uh, without the music or without the singing. And so that should be um, helpful in that respect, especially you that's concerned about the message primarily. We're not belittling the matter of singing because we like the singing, but uh, because of the circumstances, we won't be able to have the singing uh, that we had on Sunday morning on the, the particular tape, but just the message. Now take your Bible today and turn to uh, Psalms chapter 11. I'm speaking on termites in the home. Now I want you to follow me in the scriptures because we do have many termites today in our homes and we need to realize that and try to get rid of them. And I want to read this uh, scripture here in Psalms chapter 11. In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mounting. For lo, the wicked bent their bow. They made ready their arrow upon the string that they may privately shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, I want you to notice verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, then what can the righteous do? And so today we have many termites in our homes that's tearing our homes apart, destroying our families, separating husbands and wives, causing little children to suffer. And these things we're deeply concerned about. Just the other day, my dear wife uh, went to see her a doctor that she checks with uh, semi-annually in order for a physical. He's a good old-fashioned, good old homely country doctor. And he'll sit down and talk with his patients. And he's just like a dad to many of his patients and good old gentleman. And so he lost his wife some time ago. And oftentimes my wife said he seemed to be very sad uh, when she'd go in to pay him a visit. And she knew he was grieving about the loss of his wife. And he began to talk with my wife about that matter. And he said to her, he said, Ms. Edwards, uh, you and uh, Mr. Edwards ought to live every day as though that would be your last day upon the earth. You know, I, I thought about that many times. Uh, husbands and wives today should live as though that would be their last day together upon the earth. Because that time is coming when you're going to have to leave each other. The time is coming whenever you say goodbye to your husband or goodbye to your wife and uh, be placed in the ground. And you won't be able to see him anymore until uh, you meet him in heaven if you're a born again Christian and they are saved. And so we have termites today tearing our homes apart when in our homes should be more kindness and love and sympathy and consideration. And so I'll mention some of these termites. Number one, we have the old termite of fussing and nagging. Fussing and nagging. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 24, it's better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. Now, did you get that verse of scripture? The Bible says it's better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling wife in a wide house. And what God is saying here is, it's better to climb up on top of the house and sit up there like a bird sitting on the hop top of the house than to have a fussy wife in your home that's always fussing about something. You know, you have many husbands and wives, they very seldom ever speak a kind word to each other. They're always fussing, growling, and grumbling about something, and that's wrong. Likewise to the wife, it'd be better if she went up on top of the roof and sit up there like a, a mocking bird and and then to be in a house where a man is fussing and quarreling and growling about something all the time. Someone asked a little girl one time, said, Do your daddy uh, have a den in your house? She said, No, he growls all over the house. Well, beloved, we shouldn't be growling and fussing. Many times little children have to sit around and listen 
that growling and nagging and fussing all the time. And that's not right. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 1, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but a grievous word stirreth up anger. There's a time in your life, dear man, whenever you know your wife is not feeling good, things have gone wrong, maybe she had problems during the day, and you go in and you, you notice she's not in the best of humor, and she might be a little bit snappy. That'll be the time when you ought to be as kind and as considerate and as loving as possible. There's a time, dear woman, when your husband comes in, he's had a hard job, a hard time on the job, and things have gone wrong, and, and he's a little bit irritable, and he comes in, he might be a little cross, uh, but that'll, that'll be the time when you use a soft word. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stirth up anger. I was reading in the Reader's Digest the other day about this man that loved to play golf. He'd go out on Sunday at noon and play golf until 2 o'clock, and then they'd always get him by 2 o'clock. On this particular Sunday, he was 7.30 getting home. And his wife said to him, said, why are you so late? He said, well, it's like this. said, uh, I was on the way back from the golf course, and there I saw a woman that had a flat tie on an automobile, and said, I got out and helped her fix the tie. And said, in the meantime, she gave me uh, some uh, uh, drink, a whiskey to drink, and we drank together for a while and talked. And then, of course, he said, we went from there to a motel, and we got us a motel room and spent the rest of the afternoon in the motel room. She said, listen, man, said, don't you come here with that kind of stuff. Now, you might as well admit you played 26 holes today. Well, we need to realize there's a time whenever we misjudge, and there's a time whenever we're too fussy about little things we shouldn't be fussy about. Sometimes the, the wife fusses on the husband about maybe going hunting or going fishing. And, and uh, maybe the, the husband fusses on the wife about she went shopping. And it takes a woman, you know, a lot longer time to do shopping than it does a man. A man can go to town and walk into a shoe store and the first store he goes to he buys a pair of shoes. The wife can go to town, she'll go in the shoe store, she'll try on a few pair, she go to several other shoe stores and try on a few pair, and come back to the same shoe store where she tried on the first pair and buy that pair. Oftentimes men wonder why she didn't buy it to begin with, but women like to shop, they like to see what's in the store, take a look at it, and maybe spend more time shopping than the husband thinks she should, and he's a little irritable about that and fussy about it. That should not be, you ought to be considerate. You need to realize that fussing and nagging is, is a terrible termite in the home. Now, you know what a termite is. A termite is that little insect that uh, looks like an ant. It has wings, and it gets into the seals of your house, and you won't realize the damage being done until that house is about ready to cave in. Those termites eat up the seals and, and eat up the foundation, and down will go your house. And there's termites in our homes today that need to be destroyed, without a shadow of a doubt. I want to mention termite number two, and that's the termite of meddling in-laws. Did you know there's a lot of homes, a lot of problems today because in-laws meddling in the affairs of their children. Now, when your children get married, they're to get out on their own, and the in-laws should stay out of their business. Now, don't misunderstand me. There may be a time whenever your children might seek some advice that you might give them advice without causing any problem. But whenever your children get married, and if they get married, they ought to be settled enough and know enough how to manage to be able to get out on their own. Now, if they don't know how to do that, they have no business getting married. They ought to stay with mom and dad and grow up because they don't know how to manage, and they shouldn't get married if they don't know how to manage. Now, you need to realize that. But many times, the mother-in-law, she's going to nose in and tell her daughter how to operate a home. Your daddy never did it like this. And if I were you, I, I wouldn't let your husband do it in this manner. And likewise, the father to the son, he'll say, now listen, your daddy never did let your mother dictate to him about this. And you shouldn't let your wife be telling you what to do. And then nose into the children's affairs and business, and that is wrong. And that's a termite in the home. There's been many of a home destroyed and, and broken up because the meddling in-laws meddle into the children's affairs. Now, that doesn't mean that children should not love, honor, and appreciate their parents. They should honor, love, and appreciate their parents. 
and respect them and help them in time of need and help look after them and when they're old. But uh, the, the parents should stay out of their children's business. The Bible plainly says in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 31, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife. So the Bible says leave father and mother and be joined unto your wife. That's what you do when you get married. Now when you marry that girl, you don't marry her mom and daddy, you marry her. When you marry that young man, lady, you don't marry his mother and daddy, you marry him. And then to respect that, you have to realize that when you get married. There's a case one time where this mother-in-law was nosing into her, her daughter's business and affairs and, and whenever her boyfriend would come pay a visit on a date, then when he would leave, mother would come in and ask questions, want to know what he said, what did you all talk about? Always nosing in on what took place when the boy came to see her daughter. And finally time came for an engagement and to get married. And so they became engaged and began to plan the wedding. And the mother goes to the daughter and she says, Now, I, I want to go with you on your honeymoon. Remember that we've been very close as daughter and mother and I want to go with you on your honeymoon. She said, Mama, you know you can't do that. Said my fiancé wouldn't stand for that. You, you, you just can't do that, Mama. That caused tr uh, problems. She said, no, I want to go with you on your honeymoon. And so she went to her boyfriend and told him about it. He said, well, I, I just don't appreciate it. But if, uh, if nothing else to do but for her to go, well, let her come along. And so the waiting time came and they got married. And they went away on their honeymoon. They stopped at a motel. And of course, Mother, she was right along there with them. And they, uh, they, they bought them a room, they were in the room, and, and of course uh, they had a little leisure time to walk around uh, the motel, and there was a zoo nearby. And they decided to walk down and look at the animals in the zoo. So Mama was walking out front several feet ahead, and here comes the daughter and her husband. They're walking along, they came down to the, the part of the zoo where there was a, a mean lion. And when that lion saw him coming, he jumped out of that fence and he jumped on that mother-in-law. And she began to scream and cry for help. And, and the daughter said to her uh, husband, said, uh, uh, I want you to do something, do something. said, look what's happening. Um, and you know what her husband said? He said, that lion got himself in that mess. Let him get out the best way he can. And so we need to realize that meddling in-laws many times cause trouble. That's a termite in the home. And we need to stay out of our children's business and affairs when they get married. If they're not old enough to run their own home, then they should remain single and stay with mother and daddy. Too many homes broken up because of meddling in-laws. Then we come to termite number three, and that's a termite of strong drink. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 29, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contention? Who has babblings? Who has wounds without cause? Who hath the readiness of eyes? They that tear along at the wine. At last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Beloved, many, many homes have gone on the rocks today because of alcohol, because of strong drink. That's a terrible termite in the home. Many of a good lady, a good wife, has had her heart broken and little children neglected and, and maybe not have proper food and clothing the way of proper health, care, and shelter because of a drinking husband. That drinking is a terrible termite in the home. It's a dangerous thing. It'll cause a lot of trouble, a lot of heartache. You go to the prisons today and begin to interview the inmates in many prisons and they'll tell you that they were drinking when they committed that crime. They are blaming on booze. But you listen to me, beloved. That's a dangerous thing. That'll break your home up. Many of a good man today has had a good wife and a good family. And because of the bottle, his home is gone. His health is broken. He lost his job, lost his business. Been many of a good businessman today that lost a good business because of alcohol. Oh, listen to me. You Maybe you start out dram drinking or maybe drink a little beer, a little wine, and eventually ends up with stronger drink and maybe dope. And that's a terrible termite in your home. That'll tear your home to pieces. And many of a home broken up. And many of the little children sent to an orphanage home. And many of them in trouble today because of alcohol. The alcohol has no place in your home. Don't put it in your home. Keep it out of your refrigerator. Have nothing to do with it. It can tear your home to pieces. 
And shame on you if you become involved in alcohol and cause your little children to have to, have to suffer because of it. It's a terrible termite in your home. Number four, there's a termite of showing uh, uh, no, no appreciation one toward another. You know, husbands, wives need to be very considerate about each other. Notice the little things that they do for each other. We need to realize that many times uh, our wives um, iron our shirts and, and, and wash our clothes, iron our clothes, and cook our food and make up the bed and clean the house. And uh, many times we don't tell them we appreciate it. You ought to tell your wife over and over again how you appreciate the good meal she cooked and, and how you appreciate her keeping the house clean and making up the beds and looking after the, the little children and caring for the house and, and uh, helping to uh, watch after you and take care of you when you need it so badly to wash your clothes and so forth. You ought to tell her how you appreciate that. Then you women today, you ought to tell your husband time and time again how you appreciate him going out and laboring and earning money and, and sacrificing to provide for your home and educate the children and do what he can to provide financially for that home. You ought to tell him that. Tell him you appreciate that so very much. These little things many times will mean a whole lot. If you don't believe it, you ought to try. Tell him how you appreciate the little things you do. Many times they overlook. Just the little things mean so much to a wife or a husband. And if you'll uh, go ahead and, and begin to make comments in a, in a wonderful way, in a positive manner to your wife or your husband, you'll see that it will do wonders. You need to realize that. Notice the little things. Be careful to notice the little things that he does and the little things that she does that means so much. Someday you may look back and regret it if you don't. Now, as a man one time, he was on the train and he had three little children and uh, there was a, car, a sleeping car like you could sleep at night and they were traveling at night and those little children began to cry. And this dear man was trying to uh, get this small child to, to hush crying and he trying to give it a bottle and, and trying to calm it down. And, and because of the crying, it aroused up a lot of people in that car on that train. One man raised up and he said, listen, fella, said, why don't you take that young to its mama? We'd like to get a little sleep on this train. Take that young to its mama, will you please? That man with tears running down his cheeks, he said, mister, I would like to give this baby to its mama. Its mama's back in the other car there, a corpse, and we have a body now back there in a coffin carrying a to a home to be buried. Said, I wish I could give this baby to its mother. The man got up, he said, let me have the baby. Others got up, said, let me take care of the other children. And some of those people there on that train took care of that little baby that night, took care of the other children so that man himself could get a little rest. Oh, he said, I would. To God, I could place this baby in his mother's arms. She's, uh, her body is in the next car. Oh, you need to be careful how you criticize. One of the saddest things in the world today is to see a man with little small children follow the body of his wife to the cemetery, place a body there in the earth, there around his knees are little small children. He doesn't know how to handle those children like his wife. It's a pitiful situation. And we need to realize, we need to be considerate. There's a man one time that buried his wife, had one small child. That night when they went to bed, the little fella began to cry. And the father knew the little fella was oh, maybe wanting his mother or be afraid or something wrong. And the little fella, his dad said to him, said, son, said, uh, why don't you go to sleep? Said, what are you crying about? And he said, daddy, he said, is your face turned toward me? Daddy said, yes, son, my face is turned toward you. And whenever he found that dad's face was turned in his direction, then he went to sleep. I'm glad today that God's face is turned toward us. Many times when we have difficulties and problems, just remember God's face is turned toward us and he watches over his children. So you need to show your appreciation one to another because that's coming a time whenever you're going to live together your last day upon the earth. This good old doctor I talked about that told my wife, said, you and uh, Brother Edwards ought to live every day like it was your last day together upon the earth. That dear old soul was lonesome. 
He had lost his wife. He had a doctor's heart. Thank God for these good old doctors that have a calling, have a propensity toward uh, the medical field and caring for humanity. Don't have too many of them. I'm sorry to say today you have many preachers, many doctors that's not called to that profession. It's just a profession to them. They don't have a calling. A preacher, unless he's called of God, won't amount to much as a pastor, as a preacher. If he has an inward calling, uh, then he'll amount to something in the ministry. A doctor's the same way. Good old doctor that, that has an inward calling to be a doctor, loves his patients. He'll sit and talk with them, sit up with them while they're sick, be kind toward them, encourage them, because he has a doctor's heart. I'm sorry to say today that many doctors we have came out of wealthy families and they go in as a profession. It's a profession with them. They don't have a doctor's heart. They'll let the nurses do all the work and take care of all of that. And all they're concerned most about is the bill coming in to be paid to them. But you have other doctors that have a calling of God. I, I contend today we have a lot of young men and a young women in the medical profession that are poor and not able to go to school and, and train themselves as physicians. Uh, if they had the money, they'd be glad to go and they'd make genuine, good, cold doctors. And it's a shame, it's a shame you have many like that today that don't have the money to get the training. Whereas you have many coming out of rich families and it's just a profession with them. All they're concerned about is what they get out of it. And so we need to be considerate one toward another. Because we never know when we walk the last day together as husband and wife. And then we come to termite number five. And that's a termite of jealousy. That thing you call jealousy is as cruel as the grave. Solomon tells us that. Been many of a heart broken and many of a harsh thing said to a companion. Because of pure jealousy when it's all uncalled for. I know we, we, if we love one another we should be jealous of each other to a certain extent. But you can be filled with old green-eyed jealousy and can't trust one another out of your sight. That's wrong. That's wrong. You ought to have a little trust in your companion and not be filled with jealousy in regard to some other man or some other woman. Jealousy in any field is bad. A lot of people say, well... Uh, the Joneses over there, they have a boat and they have a new car. And we're going to buy us a boat and a new car. And we're going to keep up with the Joneses. Now, if you knew what the Joneses owed, you probably wouldn't be too hasty about trying to keep up with them. You don't have to keep up with anybody. Run your own business and uh, let your, your, your bills be, uh, be in parity with the income. And not bite off more than you can chew and not be jealous of other people and your neighbors and whatnot, because it's a dangerous thing. And by all means, husbands and wives should be very careful about being too jealous of each other. You should be to a certain extent, but if you're so jealous that your wife can't go shopping without you, or uh, you're so jealous your husband can't get out of your sight, then you're absolutely too jealous. I've known the husbands tied under their wives' apron strings and never get out of sight of their wives. The wives just won't... Let them get out of sight. You know, it's good once in a while for the husband and wife to get away from each other, maybe for a day or so. Maybe the husband go fishing or go off with some of his friends, a hunting or fishing for a day or two, or the wife go visit maybe a friend or someone they associated with in years gone by and maybe stay overnight, something like that. You know, I go away in revivals, and when I come back, I'm always glad to see my wife. When I get back, I look forward to seeing her. And when you're away from each other for a period of time, you're always glad to get back to each other. And a good separation, agreeable separation, a visit, or maybe a visit a relative of someone for a day or two might be good for you. Have you ever thought about that? It might be. Because sometimes you can't just stay uh, right with each other all the time, never get out of sight of each other, until if you're not careful, you become irritable and fussing at one another and wonder why. You never give each other a chance to breathe, that's why. You need to realize that that's a termite in the home. In there's old termite of comparison, being inconsiderate. I read a story about Mr. Smith and, and Mr. Jones. They came, Mr. Jones and Mrs. Jones came to visit Mr. and Mrs. Smith. And Mr. Jones turned his coffee over 
uh, on the table and, and damage the tablecloth. And, and uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Smith said, now don't, don't worry about that. Said, I, I can clean it up. It's all right. Uh, there's no, no harm done. And she's very nice and very kind about it. And when they left to go home, then the next week her husband did the same thing. And she almost scratched his eyes out. She fussed on him but turned his coffee over the table. He said, wait a minute, you know, our neighbors, our friends visited us the other day, and he turned his coffee over on the table. It was all right. It was just wonderful. And I accidentally turned mine over, and you want to fight about it. Well, you need to be considerate, kind of like uh, Mr. Brown and, and uh, Mr. Green and Mrs. Uh, Green, Mrs. Brown. Now they were visiting, and, and Mrs. Brown uh, uh, burnt the biscuits, but... Uh, Mr. Green said, you, uh, I mean, uh, said, you know, I, I, ju I just love burnt biscuits. I, I think they're healthy for you. Never mind, Mrs. Brown, that you burnt the biscuits. It's all right. I love burnt biscuits. And then when they went home, his wife burnt the biscuits, and man, he raised a fuss about it. He said, uh, he said, what do you mean, burning the biscuits? You know I can't stand to eat burnt bread, and here you are burning the biscuits. Oh, she said, you know, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Brown's biscuits that, that was burned, you know, they tasted mighty good to you. Uh, why can't these taste good to you? Don't ever embarrass your wife in front of company. I've seen men and heard men throw off on their wives. I wish my wife could cook like you. Um, I wish my wife knew how to clean the house like you or tidy up your house like you. I wish my wife knew how to dress like you know how to. That's embarrassing. Don't ever make a comparison like that in your, with your friends. Don't you do it as a wife. Don't you do it as a husband. That's a wrong thing to do. That tears a person's heart out. My wife and I, we have a tacit agreement. We didn't have to say we're not going to do this and that. When we got married, we never, we never embarrass each other in front of friends or company. We never compare one another with friends and company. We don't do that. We just don't do that. We didn't, we didn't make that ironclad rule, but we just, that's a tacit agreement in our hearts. We just don't do that. And that's wrong. Don't get your wife or your husband out in company and embarrass them by telling them that you wish that they, your husband was good as uh, so-and-so's husband or uh, wife or so forth. That's bad. That's a termite in the home, making those comparisons. And then there's the old termite of money matters. You know, that thing has caused a lot of trouble in many homes. Playing out money matters. Now, you need to realize that you can mighty easily live above your income. And many people have made that mistake. We find many young people today that, that uh, when they start out, they want to start out like mother and dad. Well, that when, when it took mother and dad 40 years to get. They, they want to have what mother and dad has when it took mother and dad 40 years to get what they have. They say, we've got to have this. Mother and dad has it. We've got to have that. Mother and dad has it. And they go out and they ram themselves in debt. And they buy more than they can pay for. As the old saying goes, they bite off more than they can chew. And beloved, many times that causes trouble in the home. I've known many of a home, many of a husband and wife get into an awful fuss because they couldn't meet their obligations. Because they couldn't pay their bills. That'll hurt you in your home. That'll damage your health. That'll cause you to have ulcers in your stomach. And it'll hurt you spiritually. If you have bills to pay and, and you've bought more than you can pay for. You've bit off more than you can chew. That's going to hurt you between you and your companion. In spite of all you can do, it's going to have its effect. And then not only that, when you come to the house of God... It'll hurt you spiritually. What are you trying to say, preacher? I'm trying to tell you, if you're listening today as a young couple, when you start out, you need to just buy what you can pay for. Well, there's nothing wrong in buying a little something on the credit if, uh, if you can pay for it and meet your obligation. Over in Greenwood, South Carolina, they had a, a jewelry store over there that says it's okay to okay. Well, it might be all right to... Uh, might be okay to okay, but uh, it'd be better if you didn't okay. And just uh, go ahead and pay for what you have. I, I don't believe in going to in debt for a whole lot of 
jewelry, expensive jewelry and stuff like that that you really don't need. A lot of people go out and pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars for real high-priced jewelry uh, whenever they know they shouldn't do it, when they know it's going to strain them to pay for it, when they know it's going to cause problems in the family to try to meet those bills, you shouldn't do it. You should go out and just buy what you can pay for it. When my wife and I got married, we lived here in the state of Georgia, and we moved to the city of Greenville, South Carolina immediately. In fact, I rented uh, about three rooms there in Greenville and a home for us to dwell in, and we had all they had could use about two of them. And uh, we went back to Greenville on Sunday, and on Monday we went to a, a furniture store, and we bought secondhand furniture. We bought a secondhand stove, we bought a secondhand uh, bed, we bought a secondhand table, secondhand chairs, good use chairs and table and stove, nothing, nothing wrong with them. It wouldn't hurt too bad. Somebody just bought them, couldn't pay for them, kept them back. And so we bought that kind of furniture. And our furniture bill back in those days uh, was about uh, $2 a week, maybe, something like that. A grocery bill was some $4 a week. But that's a, that's a lot different now. But we knew we could meet those bills. We didn't have anything left, sometime a dollar, sometime two dollars left maybe during the week. And we'd try to maybe save a dollar of that in case we needed it. But we always paid our bills. You're listening to Baptist preacher today that's always paid his debts. I have never beat any man out of a dime that I know anything about. I had a good friend one time when I was in a... Uh, the Triple C camp back in 1936 to 38. When I got ready to leave after two years, I borrowed four dollars from a friend of mine there, and I came home. That's all that money I had was the four dollars. And uh, when I left, I seemed like couldn't get the money together to send the man the money, and I lost I lost account of him. He may be listening right now to this uh, message. I trust he is. I believe he is. But anyway. Uh, I lost uh, trace of him, didn't know what had happened to him. After God saved me, it worried me. I, I wanted to pay that. That's the only debt I have owed that I didn't pay. And because I believe in preachers paying their debts, and I believe in Christians paying their debts, I believe anybody ought to be willing to pay their just and honest debts. And so I, for years went by, many, many years went by. And finally I located the man and offered to pay the man the four dollars back plus interest. I was willing to do it. And that man's been in my church a few times. And of course, the best I remember how it worked out, I don't think he accepted me. If I sent him a check, he didn't cash it. He just wouldn't accept it. He appreciated my honesty. And he just didn't want to accept it. He wanted to give it to him. And I appreciate that, bless his heart. But that's the only man I ever owed any money. I didn't pay. And as soon as I found out how I could pay him, I most certainly uh, paid him. But it was a long, long time in me paying him. But as soon as I found out how I could, I did. And I did it as quick as I found out his address, how I could get in touch with him. But let me listen. Don't go and buy more than you can pay for. My wife, she cuts out these little coupons out of magazines and papers and whatnot. And uh, when we go to the grocery store, bless her heart, she has a handful of those little coupons where you save a dime on this and a 25 cent on that and 30 cents on this. And, and when we come to pay our grocery bill, we save about three or four dollars with those coupons. But I found out that she was being tricked a little bit at the beginning because she had a coupon where she could save 30 cents on an item and she didn't need the item and went ahead and bought it because she could save 30 cents. But we talked the thing over. I said, well, honey, you... You're not saving anything like that. If you don't need it, then just don't buy it, although you have the coupon. And so we, uh, she uh, straightened that business out. She has quite a few coupons. But she only used the coupons for things that she needs to buy. And that's the way to do it. A lot of people go to town because they find something on sale. They don't need it. But they go ahead and buy it because it's on sale. Well, you shouldn't do that. You get yourself in financial trouble and buying and that's a termite in your home that will really cause you heartache. And so there's a lot of termites in the home. Then the next termite I want to mention 
is a matter of lack of love and consideration for each other. How long has it been since you told your wife how much you loved her? How long has it been since uh, you told your husband how you appreciate him? Don't you appreciate that handsome man with those strong shoulders? Why don't you put your arms around his neck and say, Honey, I appreciate those strong shoulders and you being a real husband and protecting us and providing our need and, and give him a big old kiss and tell him how much you appreciate him. Why don't you put your arms around that little girl that you took from a good family and you chose her from all the women in the world and she became your wife and you became one. How long has it been since you took her in your arms and hugged her real good and told her how much you loved and kissed her real good and, and tell her she's just as sweet and lovely as she's ever been? You ought to do that. Oh, you say, preacher, that's been a long time since. Well, that may cause trouble in your home. You need to realize your wife likes to hear you tell her that you love her. And, of course, the husband likes to hear the wife say she loves and appreciate him. You ought to tell your wife quite often you love her. And you ought to tell your husband quite often that you, lo often that you love him. You ought to do that. I'll tell you this. I bring my message toward a close. There's a man one time. His wife's in ill health. And uh, he, the preacher was coming to his house for lunch that day. And the wife was going to cook chicken, get everything ready for the preacher. And the husband said, now me and my wife can't get along. We fuss and quarrel. She's in ill health, a drugstore bill every week. And I think I'll just slip over to the church house and just tell the preacher what our problems is. And so maybe he can help us. And he went over to the church house and he sat down and the old pastor being a wise man of God. And he listened as the man told him about he and his wife couldn't get along too well, and she's ill health, a drugstore bill every week, seemed to be cross all the time, and, and just seemed like there's a fuss in the home. And uh, he said, now listen, let me talk with you. He said, now, how long has it been since you took your wife in your arms and told her how sweet she was, how much you loved her, and how pretty she was, and how you appreciate her? Oh, he said, preacher, we stopped that business after we first married, he said, yes, I thought so. He said, that's your trouble right there. He said, if you'll uh, buy your wife a gift on a special occasion and buy a new dress and tell her you love her and you appreciate it and she's just as beautiful to you as she's ever been and, and what a wonderful companion she is, that you'll see the color come back to her cheeks and you'll, you'll see her getting better health and you won't have to be buying so much uh, drugstore medicine. And he got to thinking about it. He said, well, that might work. I think I'll do that. At least maybe I can save a drugstore bill. So on the way back home, he went by and bought a nice, beautiful box of candy. And he's going to start right then. He wasn't going to wait. He bought that box of candy, and he walked in. He had that candy in his hands. He set it down and said, look, honey. He said, I bought you a beautiful box of candy. And he took her in his arms, hugged her real good, kissed her real good, and said, you know, I love you, and you're the sweetest thing I've ever seen, and I appreciate you so very much. And she began to cry and scream, and she said, of all times in the world for you to come home drunk is when the preachers come into our house. Well, it may be that you have to kind of take it easy and all. If you're not used to that, kind of slip up on the blind side, but it'll pay you to do it. Man, one time, he's... Uh, he'd always, uh, when he'd go by his house, he didn't know whether to go in or not. And he'd throw his hat in. And if the hat stayed in, he'd go in. If the hat came zooning back out the door of the window, he'd put it back on, walk down the road another mile or two and come back. And wouldn't go in that hat stayed in. Oh, listen to me. I want to say something to you in closing today. You need Jesus, the head of your home. You need Jesus there to help you in your home. It's hard to make it without God today. Christ ought to be the head of your home, the head of your family. Should be great love among you and your wife and your children. My, how you ought to love one another. You ought to appreciate each other because you never know when you're going to travel your last mile together. You never know when you're going to travel your last day together. I'll never forget what the good doctor told my wife, said Miss Edwards, you and Brother Edwards ought to live every day as though that day was your last day together upon the earth. Oh, dear soul, you need to do that. I hope the message today has meant something to you. 
entitled Termites in the Home. It's on tape number 319. And you can get this message on this tape for a gift of $3 hit pay for our radio time. And this is my mailing address, Virgil Edwards, Post Office Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. Pray for me and write to me. And you can always write back and get the tape, more of them if you'd like to have them. And remember us in your prayers, and we appreciate it so very much. Shall we pray? Father, I pray you'll take the message entitled Termites in the Home and use it today for the glory of God. In the name of Jesus, I do pray, and for his sake, amen. <laughs>